Welcome to the Philosophy of Science lecture. Last lecture we spoke about the relation between correlation and causality and we said and learned that we cannot infer from a correlation between two variables A and B uh, to a causal relation between them, a causal connection, because there may be hidden variables which are responsible for that correlation. And we discussed the case of a hidden common cause C. So in that case, um, C, the variable C, say C is on and off a binary variable, C causes A and C causes B, and therefore we have this correlation. Because when C causes B, there is a correlation between A and C, and since correlation is symmetric, this means that the presence of A increases the probability of C, so the presence of the effect, of the effect increases the probability of the cause. And then C, the presence of the cause, increases the probability of the other effect, right? Even in the presence of A. So C increases the probability of B. This implies that there is a correlation between A and B. So our example where, for instance, there is a correlation between the drop of the barometer reading and the coming of the storm, which is an event in the future, but there can't be, of course, a, a causal connection between those two. They have a common cause, the drop of the, of the atmospheric pressure. You know, you, you remember we also spoke about this joke example about the correlation be between the frequency of stalks, right, and the frequency of newborn babies, right, there is a correlation between the two, but that's not because the myth of the stalks is true, that stalks bring the newborn babies, but because the common cause variable here is rural versus urban areas. In rural areas there are more stocks and there are also more newborn babies. We spoke about a statistical criterion for the detection of a hidden variable C which goes back to Reichenbach and is called the screening off condition. This criterion says right, that if you have such a correlation between A and B and if you find a variable C so that you and if you then conditionalize the correlation to fixed variables of that to fixed values of that variable C and if then this correlation which is then a conditional correlation breaks down becomes zero then C is a hidden variable which is responsible for the correlation. So, and you say C screens off A from B. There is no direct causal connection between A and B in that case. C screens it off. For instance, in that case, C may then be a common cause variable. So conditionalization means in that case that you, for instance in the case of the stalks and the newborn baby example, you consider only stalks and babies in rural areas and then there will be no correlation there, right? And you consider only urban areas, there will be no correlation there. Okay, there's one problem with this screening off criteria, namely that there is a second situation in which also C screens off A from B and the screening off criterion cannot distinguish these two different causal scenarios. The second situation are so-called hidden intermediate causes. They are also called intervening variables in, for instance, social sciences. Here you have a situation of this sort. Right? There's a correlation between A and B. This correlation is due to an intermediate cause C. So A causes C and C causes B. So in that case, A is an indirect cause of B, so to speak. Right? Also here, if you conditionalize on fixed variables of this va variable, so you consider only sub samples, of, so you consider only samples where the value of C is constant, is the same, then there can be no further correlation between A and B, right? Because an increased frequency of A has, can only have an effect on the frequency of B's via 
an effect on the frequency of C's here, so the, there is no effect which is propagated from A to B if the value of C is fixed. Okay, and this is also an important thing because this knowledge can really change your interpretation of the causal situation. And here's an example which is, comes from a, actually I think a student of uh, Lazarsfeld, also from the social sciences, namely from Zeisel. That was, um, again in the 70s, uh, in the time when there were empirical investigations, uh, the condition of workers, of capitalism, but then that was already the area where the emancipation of women began, the women started to work more frequently and this was an investigation where they found a correlation between the marital status of women, so the population where working women um, in firms, so married or single, and their frequency, the frequency of the absence from work, right? And you have just this, uh, this correlation, married women are more frequently absent from work. Well, you may, you don't know what's going on, but what, uh, what is the mechanism here? Maybe married women are l more lazy, I mean, or married women are less motivated to work because their husband is already earning money, or, or what's going on. But then it turned out that the variable of the amount of extra housework to be done screens off this correlation, right? Married women typically have extra housework to be done, so they have to work at home in addition, though they have to work more, not less, than unmarried women. And that is the reason why they are more frequently absent from work. That the, that the causal path goes over C was found out exactly precisely by fixing on, on, on fixed values of C. So if they compared uh, 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 only women, married and single women, who had no housework to be done, for instance, so they had, who had the same amount of housework to be done, there was no more correlation. So for instance, some of the married women have, have a housemaid who does the housework, they have no housework, and some single women have no housework, so they compare single and married women with the same amount of housework, for instance, no housework, then there's no more correlation. Or they compare both single women and, and married women with, with a lot of housework, then there's no more correlation. So this shows that the correlation is due to this uh, to see the variable within that case is, of course, which you know from the background knowledge, um, an intermediate cause, and not a common cause, because I mean the marital status of a woman is, cannot be the effect of, of, of the amount of extra housework. That's an independent variable. You know that as a background knowledge, because it's a free decision. So this is a, an example where you see that the information about the intermediate variables is really important. And in both cases, let me go back, in both cases, right, you have a screening off condition. So by the pure statistical information, you cannot distinguish between the two. In some situations, that may even be a problem. For instance, here's such an example, which I have on, on uh, I think Van von, Faas von mentioned it, I'm not sure now. For instance, you have a correlation between drinking coffee and heart disease. And this correlation breaks down if you conditionalized on the third variable of being a smoker, right? So, but this means, but, but it's not clear then whether this is a common cause or an intermediate cause. Uh, I mean, if drinking coffee tempts you to smoke in some way or others, if, if you drink a lot of coffee, then your inclination, you're, you're, you're more tempted to smoke, right? So then you would have this error, then um, it would be an intermediate cause. While if uh, smoking is more, more or less, smokers are more tempted to drink coffee. I mean, you know that smoking and coffee drinking, caffeine and nicotine have com uh, opposite effects on the, on, the, on the vessels and on the blood pressure. And so in, in some sense, both arrows here have a certain physiological plausibility. If that error is dominating, you have a common cause, right? And it may, of course, also that drinking coffee and smoking are even correlated by a third, by a fourth variable here, which is a common cause of both. It may, may also be, right? That may also be the case. So, and this remark, of course, may draw your attention to the fact that 
The result of such a causal al an analysis using the screening off condition is always relative to a certain background assumption about what are the possibly relevant variables, right? If you have the suspicion that the variable C may be a common cause of a given correlation, you test it and it does not screen off, then you have eliminated the possibility that that is a common cause. But it may be that a fourth variable, a fifth variable, D or E, is a common cause. So what, all what you can do is you think about what are the possibly relevant variables, you test them for common causes, and if none of them screens it off, then you have a conjecture, causal conjecture, well, there is really a connection between the two variables, A and B. So causal conjectures are really highly knowledge dependent and um, and conjectural, I mean in the sense that they are preliminary, right? So they are really very hypothetical assertions and, th and also, of course theory law. I mean the notion of cause effect is of course a, a, a theoretical notion, it goes beyond what is statistically empirically observable. Okay, so some questions until this point. So if not, then let me go on. You may ask, so is there, isn't there any other, uh, in, in such a case, uh, like, like the drinking coffee and heart disease case, isn't there any other possibility of finding out what is the right causal direction? And in, in fact, there is a possibility, namely, if you can manipulate the variable A, if you can experimentally, so in, for instance in form of an experiment, if you can uh, intervene by active manipulation produce the onset of A, right? assume A is a binary variable, then in the case of an indirect cause, the effect of, of producing A will be propagated through B and will have B as an effect, while the effect of producing A in the common cause case will not lead to B. Right? And this is also very important for the meaning of a so-called random experiment. You know, the reason why this is possible at all, that you have a correlation with, with all the, uh, which is the effect of a common cause, is that if you just make poll or a survey, so a field analysis, then of course you have two, two groups then, and an experimental group of A's and a control group of non-A's, and it will be, it be the case that you, it, your, your A control, as we called it, your A sample, right, will have a higher frequencies of C's than your non-A sample, right. So if you just um, collect newborn babies, right, in your country, then those places where you have more newborn babies will have a, f will have a higher frequency of being a rural area than those places where you have less newborn babies, right. So you will have a higher frequency of C scoring with, with A's in the, in the A group than in the non-A group. And that's the reason why I've got this uh, correlation. If you do a random experiment, uh, you first collect the sample, of every, uh, so a random sample of, uh, of the population, right, of arbitrary individuals. Then you divide it randomly into two halves, and after you have done this, so after you have done this, the frequency of C's here is approximately the same as the frequency of C's here, right? Because you just randomly split the population. After you have done this, you introduce the variable A here by manipulation and the, and the non-A here. And by this, in this way, now your experimental group and your control group have the same frequency of C's, right? And so a common cause situation can no longer arise, right? So the correlation in the random experiment between A and B will break down because the frequency of C's in both uh, groups is the same. But that will not work in that case, right? An intermediate cause cannot be eliminated by the method of random experiment because here C is an effect of A, right? And so here, when, uh, as soon as you introduce C, uh, as you introduce A here by manipulation, C will be the effect. So by, by an intervention or by an experimental manipulation, you can make the cause statistically independent of all of its non-effects, right? 
but you can of course not make it independent from if, if it, in its effects. So with, an, with, a, with a random experiment you really can discriminate the two cases if the correlation breaks down in a random experiment. If there is a correlation in a random experiment, if there is a hidden variable involved, then it can only be a hidden variable which is an intermediate cause. And from this example you of course also see the, hidden, the intermediate cause example that information about intermediate causes can really change your interpretation. So this means that even a random experiment is, is not a, a universal cure for causal misinterpretations, right? Because even in, a, even in a random experiment you can smuggle in by your experimental variables certain other variables which are the effects of it which you don't know and which, which uh, are the true causes of, of, of the effect, which, of the ultimate effect which you, measure, which you measure and which you're interested in. So, any questions to that? So if, that, if there are no more questions here, then let me go to a final example. Uh, there is a nice example of how these criteria work, which is due to Nancy Cartwright. Nancy Cartwright is a philosopher of science who very early dealt with uh, this problem of how you can infer or not infer causality from correlation. And she gave the following example. There was at a university in, in the USA, there was found a correlation between the gender of the uh, applicants uh, for, for the university study and the, the admission rate. You know at uh, US universities not everyone can study. You have to pass a certain test. And there's a certain admission rate, so a certain uh, acceptance rate uh, among the applicants and the, the frequency of female, apl uh, accept, of, of female applicants who were accepted, who passed the test, was significantly lower than the frequency of male applicants. So the question was, what is the reason for this correlation, right? Uh, so this was a nice example. Um, so we have gender. So this is one variable and the admission rate. Uh, So what is the reason for the correlation? Well, what would you say? What could be a reason? Any suggestions? Yeah? The discrimination. Well, this was actually the, the second hypothesis. Um, any other uh, hypothesis? Well, discrimination. Well, discrimination was, was, was hard to test. Right? The, 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 if that is a common cause or an intermediate cause in that case, right? discrimination, then it would mean that the university system is a certain patriarchal uh, system. It, it prefers males uh, uh, over women on, on certain reasons. That would be hard to, uh, to, to manipulate. I mean, it could be done. Do you have an idea how it could be done? Blind application. Blind application, exactly. But they didn't do that. Because we'll see another uh, thing then already led them to the two uh, uh, hypotheses, to the confirmed hypothesis without that. But they couldn't do it, right? Just, just um, you, you need to have the information about the, the, the sex of the applicant, yeah. What, what, what could else be the reason? <laughs> yeah? Maybe uh, female applicants uh, applied to... Well, no, but, but, yeah, but uh, I think you are already on the right track. That is too early now. <laughs> Thank you, but, but this comes later. Just, oh, why not the intelligence? Uh, I mean, that's maybe politically incorrect to say, but I mean, in science, you, you, you should test all kinds of hypotheses, right? But, it could be that male are just more intelligent than females, right? No? Yeah. <laughs> yes. So let's speak it out. <laughs> that could be a cause. So that they tested. That is easy to test, right? They just made an additional IQ test, additional to the, to the exam test, which uh, tests for certain competences. And when the variable IQ was held constant, 
what happened? Um, the correlation did not work down. I mean, when they compared uh, female and male applicants with the same IQ, still the admission rate for the female applicants with the same IQ was to the same amount lower than the admission rate for male applicants with the same IQ. So, fine. So you see, this is falsified. The, the, the IQ is, a, is, a, is responsible for this correlation. It's falsified by that means. So it was, it was quite uh, useful to, to do this uh, test uh, just to eliminate a false hypothesis, right? Okay, so it was not, it's not IQ. The next hypothesis is what, could it be that the university system is patriarchal? Well, well uh, no, yes, no, um, how should we test it, right? But then, the third hypothesis led to the true effect, and I think you already guessed it now, maybe you say it once again. Uh, yeah, I, I think maybe the female applicants applied to subjects that are more popular, exactly. while the uh, male applied to the informatics or mathematics, exactly. not um, many female. Exactly, this was the surprising reason that the female applied uh, to uh, fields of study that were more popular, therefore they had stricter exams right? and therefore lower acceptance rates. And, and so how did they uh, experimentally or uh, empirically just empirically, they didn't make experiments here, empirically verify this very simply by comparing the, the correlation rates between gender and admission rate in each a field of study. So if the field of study was held constant, right, the correlation broke down. So the correlation broke down and that was the proof that this, this variable screens off the correlation and since the gender is an independent variable, here again we know the background knowledge, I mean my choice of field of study doesn't make me a female or a male, right? So it can only be this causal scenario and this was the uh, um, explanation then. Okay. So this shows that these statistical criteria may be very helpful in finding the, the right causal interpretation of a correlation. Okay, so I, I go to the next slide. Even if no hidden variables are involved. Let us assume now that we have checked for hidden variables. We have test, we have a correlation between two variables A and B and we have checked uh, according to our best knowledge um, whether there may be hidden variables which, uh, which, um, which, screen them, which screen the correlation off. And we didn't find any such variables. Um, so, so we assume we are confirmed uh, uh, and we are to a certain extent warranted to assume that there are no, no hidden variables here. Can we then, under this condition, infer from a correlation to a causal connection? Even then, we have a second problem to be solved, the problem of causal direction, right? Uh, you know, I already explained that, that correlations are always symmetric, um, but Correlations, uh, so correlations are always symmetric, but causal connections are asymmetric, right? They go from the cause to the effect, but not in the other direction. So, um, so you, you don't know which is the cause and which is the effect, and this may be uh, very important for the interpretation of your correlation. Here's the first example. Um, the height of the IQ, right, is correlated with the social status of a person, right? So um, let's assume we measure the social status uh, in a precise way, as some weighted average of the income of a person and it, it's the degree of its academic educa education or something, right? As it is usually measured, social status. So. What should we infer from that correlation? What would you say? Yeah. IQ, high IQ causes high social status. High IQ causes high social status, right? Uh, 
So, so some people say, uh, well, they think about the Cheney elite. I mean, just people from the conservative spectrum would say, well, people, the, the, the clever, smarter people are just more successful, and so therefore they have a higher social status, right? Uh, but what is the other interpretation? Could be that uh, social status gives you certain opportunities to train your IQ. Exactly. So the people from the opposite political spectrum would say, no, wait, IQ is not primarily genetically determined, it's a product of your environment, in particular of your social environment, your education and so on. Education is costly, university education but high school education too is costly, and so the social status, that is the primary causal direction, the co social st status causes it's the cost of your IQ, right? Because if your parents are poor, they cannot afford a costly education, then you keep, uh, you keep full, so to speak, or I mean, you, you keep less non-intelligent to a certain extent because you don't have this education and, and not this training, this cognitive training and all that. Poor parents uh, need their ch ch children to start working very soon, right? And get money, right? They cannot afford them to bring them, to finance them until the age of 30. That's um, at the other direction. So, and you see, this uh, uh, worldview uh, uh, interpretation, these political interpretations of this correlation, totally depend on what is the dominant causal direction here, right? Is it from social status to health of IQ, or the other way around? I mean, of course, you are right in the even if you are a left-winged person and say the social status is the primary cause of the IQ, then there is still the, the backward uh, relation then, because if you have a lower IQ, even if IQ is a product of your environment, you are, have less chances to be successful in so far. You are, you, what you say is right anyhow, right? But the, here the primary causal direction is that in the other case it is this direction, okay. So, and again, so how should we find out? Well, I speak about that later. Let us first discuss some other examples. Second example, there is a famous, uh, famous is, is exaggerated, uh, I should say, um, often discussed correlation between aggression, aggressive tendencies of, of just of juveniles, male, ju let's speak about male juveniles, a better example, and the frequency of their watching violent films. It's again and again discussed in the media, there's this correlation, but I mean, what is the upshot, the significance of these correlations in terms of causal direction and in terms of political implications or practical implications? So if really, frequently watching violent films is a strong cause of being aggressive, of, of the aggressive tendency, just of juveniles. If the fact that these juveniles is 5% of what I mean, it's, it's a minority, but it's enough. If we have some juveniles who get criminal, who really uh, beat down people, or, or even murder them, or some, do some other things, um, well, this may be a political reason to forbid uh, uh, certain violent films, right? To, to forbid their public uh, availability, right? Yeah, if they have. But, but what, what would you say? Is this the only interpretation or what? Well, could anyone give me, <laughs> could anyone play now the opponent? <laughs> uh, yeah, please? Yeah, it might well be that people who are more aggressive are just more likely to watch violent films. Yeah. So violent films don't really do any harm, yeah. they're just a byproduct. Thank you, yes, this is, the, this is the other view. They are saying, well, like, like uh, football fans need their, 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 their uh, football uh, activities, and that may be quite aggressive in some uh, sense, but maybe in a harmless sense. Well, some hooligans are dangerous, unfortunately. Some football fans are dangerous. But I mean, um, it may just be that some people have just more aggressive tendencies than others and they need some, some, some things to lift their aggression up, to leave it out, right? To live it out, right? 
uh, to get it rid of. And, and in this, uh, and for them, watching films is a good thing because they, they can live it out without doing any harm, right? So, if the causal direction goes from here to here, from being aggressive to frequently watching violent films, then uh, the practical impl implications would, would just would, would not at all mean that you should forbid watching violent films. Maybe it's even good for, for some people to have a certain feel where they can live out their tendencies without doing any harm, right? So the question is, what is the primary cause of reaction again? Well, anyone? I mean, I'm not, I'm not a specialist on the debate, but yeah, please. Um, I think in the early years of a man's development, yeah. there can be a huge uh, causal connection from watching violent films to being aggressive. Uh -huh. But I think in the, like, at the age of 20 or something, Maybe this uh, is not that um, that a big cause. I understand. Yeah, yeah, that is the point, and and the debate on, on this problem is really differentiated. I mean, you know, um, I I know about uh, studies which show that for this um, for a certain percentage of people, this small percentage of of of, of characters, right, which have some some psychological deficits. They have a lack of neuron neurons, like a lack of empathy or something. For them, watching violent films is really dangerous. While for the majority, watching violent films does not doesn't have any significant effect on on whether they or whether they not uh, really uh, live, uh, re really act aggressively, right? For instance, and there are certain theories of aggression. Uh, like, for instance, the, there is one theory saying that aggression is this kind of um, fr reaction to frustrations. Uh, for, for this theory, the causal direction would, would, would not, certainly not go from there to there. But then there is another theory of aggression saying that aggression is a matter of learning. You imitate certain role models, and if your favorite role models have aggressive tendencies, you imitate them. For this theory, for instance, the uh, causal error from here to here would, would very well be significant. So uh, there is a quite differentiated debate on, on, on this correlation, but you see that this correlation alone does really doesn't say anything about what you should do with it, right? because you don't know the causal direction. Okay. Third is example. Uh, an interest in computers correlates with the disinterest in social relations. By the way, this, ex this uh, finding, this statistical finding, was made before the era of online games and of social online games, right? Because if you have online games, you might say that if you do online games on the computer, you have social uh, communication by the computer, right? But let's ignore that. So, what would you say? The authors of this study inferred from their finding that if you have a high um, amount of living time uh, interacting with the computer, so your interaction frequency, so to speak, with computers compared to your interaction frequency with human persons is high. Yeah. This really reduces and turns down your social abilities. That was the, uh, the hypothesis. So if you interact permanently with these machines, you lose your ability of social communicating, you, you even lose your social feelings, your empathy and so on, and therefore you get more and more disinterested in social relations because you actually, you're afraid of social relations, you, I mean, you, know, you have no success in this respect, so you sit more and more on your computer and so on. That was the hypothesis of the authors. So what do you think about that? Someone plays an opponent here? Yeah? It might be that um, people who have disinterest in social relations are not good at socially communicating. Therefore, turn to computers to uh, do something with them because they can't communicate with other people. 
Yeah, that might be. Exactly. So then the cause of the action goes from here to here. Or even some people may just be not very interested in social relation, even if they are, have the ability. They are just not interested in it. I mean, some people... I mean, I, if, if I have a partner, right, that's enough. I just need one or two friends. That's enough for me. And the rest I spend with my computer, right? I'm not really interested in, in establishing lots of social inter relations, right? I'm, 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 I'm an introverted person. I mean, of course I need, need a partner, one friend or whatever, but, but, but that's enough, right? <laughs> it's enough for me to talk with my friend or partner half an hour per day. That's, that's okay. And the rest, computer. Right? Well, there are the types of people of that sort, right? I mean, why not? And then the cause direction goes from here to here. And there is no, 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 no such thing as a, as a, um, co as a um, causal direction from here to here, such that a frequent act interaction with computers decreases your social abilities. Right? Okay. So, if we have. Uh, um, correlations of this sort. I mean, there is, of course, a, a way, a, prince, a, a way of, of finding out if you have such a correlation, and there is no third variable involved. There is, of course, a simple way of finding out which is the cause and which is the effect, if, and only if, you can manipulate the variables. Namely, if you artificially introduce A, if then you produce B, right? So if you increase at if, uh, by manipulation the frequency of A's, if then the frequency of B's increases, then the direction must go in this way. For if, if the direction is in that case, if this, then you cannot increase the frequency of the cause by increasing the frequency of the effect. That is for sure, right? So if you, uh, I mean, that, that is clear. So if someone, if really the EQ is the cause, of the social, social status and not the other way around, then if you give a, a stupid person, right, <laughs> on genetical reason, lots and lots and lots of money, that of course won't increase uh, um, its IQ, if that is true. But in the social sciences, typically you cannot manipulate these variables, that's the point. So if you cannot manipulate the variables, that is our question now, how can we find out um, how can we find out the direction? So what are the criteria for the causal direction of correlations? Um, and there are two cases to distinguish here. If we have temporally successive events, then we have a simple criterion telling us that co the causal direction is always temporally forward directed. Right? So if I have a correlation between two events, A and P, where A means eating a certain mushroom, and B means getting pains in one's stomach uh, after one hour of eating, after the eating, then it is quite obvious that A must be the cause of B. We always assume there are no third variables involved, right? So A is the cause of B, because if there is a causal connection between a temporally earlier and a temporally later event, then the causal direction must go from the earlier to the later. That is clear. But again, in, in social sciences and psychology, usually we don't have temporally located events. What we have is stationary macro variables, like a tendency of being aggressive, a frequency of wa wa watching films, an interest in computers, right? Or, or the social status and the IQ. These are temporally coexistent properties. And this doesn't mean that they instantaneously causally influence them, but that just means this property is stationary. They uh, are enduring over a certain time span. And they're all sorts of microprocesses going on, which we don't know. But we want to find out what is the independent variable and what is the dependent variable, what is the cause and what is the effect. So this is the case in all of these three examples here, which we discussed. And in that case, well, it's hard. Sometimes in all of these three examples which we discussed here, we simply don't know. I mean, it's, it's hard to know. Or maybe know a little bit about it, but, but it is controversial. It is at least to 
the least to say it is controversial in which direction the causal uh, flow goes. And it may also go in both directions, in the case of coexisting properties. Again, if it goes in both directions, this does not mean that the causal process goes temporarily backwards or and forwards or something. It means that this and this process are different causal processes. So in other cases we know it, for instance, by background knowledge. It may be background knowledge about the mechanisms which we simply have, or it may be, be, may be background knowledge about the effects of interventions which we just know without um, uh, performing the interventions, but we know from past experience or from other experiences, from other evidence, that if we would change these variables, the other variable would change, but not the other way around. So here are some examples. For instance, there is a correlation between air pollution and the frequency of respiratory illness. Um, so, what, what is the direction here? Uh, from air pollution to uh, respiratory illness. Obviously. Because just by the causal mechanism, it couldn't really be otherwise, right? I mean, if you would, by, freak, by coughing, uh, uh, very frequently, of course, in some sense you pollute the air around you, but you don't pollute it with, with uh, smoke or uh, uh, carbon or whatever is in the air, but you pollute it maybe with viruses and so on, and that is very local. So it, it is clear from elementary physical uh, knowledge that the correlation can only go in that from that to that. Right? And even if you, you could also, uh, uh, if someone, uh, say, someone who doesn't believe in physical knowledge and came from a native tribe uh, doesn't accept this uh, explanation which I gave you could, uh, you could also prove it experimentally how? Uh, look at different uh, populations where there's uh, less air pollution exactly. well that, that would actually not be an experiment if you just look at the ex that is a good point of view because that gives you once again to explain the difference. That would be not an experiment. That would be a quasar experiment if we just look at different populations. An experiment would be given. I mean, we now excluded common causes, but that difference makes a difference for the question can it be a common cause effect or not, right? But an experiment would just be given, say, if I have, have coughing problems, cough a lot, right? Um, if I change the environment and go to the seaways where there is no air pollution, go from the city to the sea, and then my coughing is, is uh, I get much better with my lung, I don't cough anymore, that would be, for instance, a proof that the direction goes from here to here. And if I would like to prove the other way, I would, I would have to send a lot of healthy persons in a certain uh, urban area, where, where, say in Beijing, where they have a lot of smog, send all the best sportsmen into Beijing, and then <laughs> the smog goes away, right? <laughs> because of that people there, would be a proof of the other direction, and obviously this is not the case. We know that from, we don't need to perform this experiment again, because we know it from background knowledge that won't certainly not be the case. So, so good. In this case, we are sure about the causal direction. Another case. Gender correlates with gender-specific features, like, for instance, um, um, certain headaches uh, are f more frequent in females than in males. The name of this headache is migraine. So, for instance, so in that case, it's, it's obvious that um, the gender is an independent variable and the gender specific feature is a dependent variable because the gender cannot be manipulated. I mean, except you, you have certain gender transplantation operation or whatever. I mean, we exclude that case now. But when that it, it does, gender certainly does not depend on, on any features which you, which you have or acquire like illnesses. Okay. There's a, a funny example of, of a historical, um, historical event in the year 70-20. Um, there was a banker, John Law, 
Philippe de France, and the French king was always in lack of money, you know, this expensive kingdom household and all, all these expenses. And John Law observed that there's a correlation between the amount of paper money which is in circulation and the wealth of a nation, right? And he made the suggestion uh, to um, produce lots of paper money, lots of uh, unsecured paper money, of course, and to put it into circulation to increase the wealth of France. And uh, the king did it, and the effect was the bankruptcy of the French financial system in 1720. That's a quite famous affair. And again, this is, this is an experiment which shows that the, the causal direction does not go from the amount of paper money to the wealth of the nation, but in the other direction, right? The typical example which, which proves the causal direction. So, you see in these cases we really can know the causal direction if you can manipulate or if you have suitable background knowledge while in the first three cases which are controversial we don't, can, uh, we don't have sufficient background knowledge, right? We cannot uh, manipulate the variables so we must be modest. As scientists we must be modest. We, we must admit that we don't know, right? Very often, what you find, in, especially in public media, it's very often the case that if people hear about correlation, they, they spontaneously interpret the correlation in, in the direction which, which confirms their worldview, right? which fits to their judgment or prejudgment. That's really very often the case. But as a, as a scientist which is interested and oriented towards objectivity, you should be reserved simply. Uh, that, that is a recommendation which I would give in that case. Um, and um, let me end this part of my lecture with some examples from unjust, of unjustified causal interpretations of correlations that have sensational value uh, from popular media. Um, there are really many examples, and if you read media, I mean, you know, there are so many correlations being reported, and usually correlations are reported by journalists directly in a causal way, without that this difficult inference step from the correlation to the causal model is explicitly reflected. Here's the first example. Um, it's from an Austrian newspaper in the year 2002. There is a correlation between a, lo a long period of priest feeding among mothers. The question is, how long should a mother priest feed her newborn? So give the priest to the newborn baby. How long should that be? Is it better to make it long or is it short? And there's, there was a correlation found between a long period of priest feeding and a lowered risk of breast cancer. So those women who have a higher risk of cancer have lower periods of breast feeding. Those women who have a lower risk of cancer have a higher um, period of breast feeding their, their babies. Uh, the correlation was reported in a, in a direct causal way that if you, you breastfeed your, your baby longer, try to do it, right? then your uh, chance of getting breast cancer will be lowered. So, what do you think about that? What could it be? Uh, everything. Could everything. Could it be a common cause, right? So it could be, and that is quite plausible, that of course it's uh, genetically, in part, genetically determined uh, uh, how good your breasts are. I mean, a certain frequency of women always in history have so, so good, good milk uh, production that they even can feed other babies, right? Some women have so good milk production and so good, good working breasts. It also depends on the age. Um, that they can feed their baby until the year of three. But some other women have, have not so well working breasts and they get inflamed if they suck too long. I, I, I myself know that for my kids, so it's, for them it's, yes? Uh, 
the the, uh, the newspaper report seems to assume that uh, women have more a greater degree of voluntary control over how long they breastfeed. Yeah. So that's why they make the inference because they seem to simply be voluntary how long you breastfeed. But of course, there's a, actually that's not true. As true. That's not true, but. It, it, so it may be a common cause that these women who have in some genetic reasons better working breasts, right, can afford to feed their baby longer because of course it has some advantages, for instance the Im Im immunological advantages, uh, more antibiotic and, or, or immunological uh, and, uh, antigens and antibodies in the, in the breast milk. So these women who can afford to, to um, feed the baby by their breast for a longer time have also uh, lower cancer rates because uh, uh, of a common cause. But to infer now from this, this practical demand would be bad for, for, for all those women whose breasts get inflamed quite early. <laughs> and if you endure breastfeeding and the breast is permanently inflamed or often inflamed, then this may even increase the chance of cancer in the breast, of course. Right? If you have every, very often an inflammation in a certain organ, this increases. This is one cause that increases cancer frequency. So, to, uh, so uh, for those women, this causal interpretation, which is unjustified and probably wrong, would not only be wrong, but it would also have practically quite negative, the opposite effects. Right? Okay. Next example. This example comes from the, uh, um, from the TV and it was reported some years ago again and that uh, was found out by Californian scientists, psychologists. It was found out that a frequent skin contact, right, skin contact in the sense of all the, for instance, the sexual skin, skin contact but or just a, some kind of genderness or, or right, uh, being stroke, being whatever. Frequent skin contact correlates with a stronger immune system. So the message was be more uh, whatever open to, uh, to skin contact, have more sex and fun or whatever. And, I mean all kinds of uh, sex and you will be healthier, you will have a stronger immune system. What do you say about that correlation? Yeah? Maybe people that have stronger immune systems are more attractive. Exactly. Yes, for instance, this may be the case that there's a causal direction which goes in the other direction or, I mean, I would, well, yeah, they may be more attractive, but the other thing is, I would, yeah? It might be because they have a stronger immune system, they are sick less often and thus um, more contact with other people because if you're sick you're going to avoid contact. Exactly. This is also a major thing. Of course, if you're sick, if you're not healthy, your sex life is going down automatically. That's just a biological mechanism. I mean, if you must be healthy in order to, to, to be full of, to, to, to want lust or whatever, to, 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 to be ready to, to do this, right? It's like if you're hungry, you know, you have, your sex life goes down. I mean, there's some more important things in that case. And even, it's the same if you're sick, right? Uh, so it's, it's clear that people who have a strong immune system, they are healthier. They're more attractive because they look nicer, because they're healthier. So both pathways, causal pathways, lead to a to, to probably do a higher frequency of skin contact. Okay. So, uh, but as you see, the point is, the message is that in the media, just read a uh, correlation reported in a certain causal way and, and no reflection about what, what is going on here. So, third example, in the Austrian newspaper Salzburger Nachricht in 2003, there is a correlation uh, among women, those women who chalk more frequently have a lower bone density. So a higher frequency of jogging yeah, correlates with a lower bone density. And since bone density is of course, uh, a, a, a reduced bone density is a danger, for, especially for women, especially for older women, right? they, they, they may break their bones more often then. The causal interpretation was you shouldn't jog too often 
you women, because that may, might reduce your bone density. So what, what do you see, think about that? Ideas? Yeah? Maybe you're jogging? No. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, it's difficult uh, to jog uh, with um, a high bone. Yeah, it's difficult to jog with a high bone. Yeah. 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 Yes. Yeah? yeah, that's right. So the cause of the reaction may be a very different story. Uh, those people who have a high bone density on some other reasons are of course heavier. More generally speaking, those people who have a tendency to be heavier, right, have of course also a higher bone density. That's, that's medically assured, that's for sure, right? because you need stronger bones, for instance, if you have a tendency to be high weighted. And of course, I'm jogging, so I know this for sure, if you have a higher weight, jogging is much, much more troublesome, right? It may, the troubles which you can get from jogging, the pains like here and the, the hips, uh, the ankles or the feet, uh, uh, everything is much, much more troublesome. Uh, the risk of, of, of getting pain from jogging is it's higher if you have a high weight, if you are a high weight person, that is clear. And therefore, it's quite, uh, quite uh, plausible that women who are low-weighted uh, characters, so to speak, who have a low bone, bone density, just are much more motivated to jog, and, and for them, jogging is much more fun than for the high-weighted and uh, high bone density people. But to, so uh, the, the recommendation, you should not jog, is, is just, just a, a result of a wrong causal interpretation, and so though it's, it's really dangerous to interpret uh, correlations causally without reflecting about the possibilities. Final example, Bavarian DV. Uh, men who eat a lot of chocolate are gentler and have, a better, have better social skills. There's a correlation between the social skills of men and their gentleness, tenderness, and the frequency they eat chocolate. I just say about that correlation. So, so the message, eat more chocolate in order to <laughs> be more beloved by your female partner or whatever, you men. <laughs> So again, it could be, of course, I mean, it could be a, 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 a common cause. It's, for instance, plausible. There are certain types, right, and certain types. Some, some eat my chocolate, my social. I don't know what it is. But in any case, the idea to get more social by eating more chocolate is, seems to me somehow quite absurd because it's known that eating more chocolate increases the cholesterol level in the blood and that increases the blood pressure and that increase make one, makes one of course quite, if you have a high blood pressure you typically are not very social but you're getting aggressive or nervous or whatever and also it, it increases the chance of, of your, uh, your dying quite early by heart attack or whatever. So maybe this, this correlation was launched by a radical feminist party who wanted to, <laughs> to reduce, make, uh, increase the death rates of male, I don't know. But I mean, it's just crazy to infer from that, uh, well, eat more chocolate now, men to become more social, social, right? So, but it was reported. So it was reported even in the TV, so you see. Uh, so this concludes my list of examples and you see that how important it is to have this knowledge, this critical knowledge about the difference between a correlation and a causal connection and to, in, to transport all of this knowledge in, in the public media uh, because again and again uh, uh, there, uh, uh, there you find uh, reported correlations which are causally interpreted in a completely unjustified way. Okay, so this concludes this part of my lecture. Are there some final questions or further comments on, on these problems? Are you or other? Yeah. No? Well, if this is not the case, then I'm finished with the third part of my lecture. You remember this third part was about um, how 
we test hypotheses, law hypotheses, either of a strict or of a statistical form, which are empirical in the sense that the variables or concept occurring in this, in this law hypothesis are measurable independently from the law hypothesis. So they are measurable by empirical means or by some means they may be somehow theory loaded but they, what you assume for measuring them is totally independent from the truth value of the hypothesis under test. That is the important thing. Right? So you can measure them independently. All variables occurring in the, in the hypothesis which you test. The fourth part of my lecture now is about scientific theories. Scientific theories, as I distinguish them from empirical hypotheses, uh, contain concepts, I call them theoretical terms or theoretical concepts, that are not empirically measurable or observable. More generally speaking, they are not measurable, these variables, in a direct way, right? Independently from assuming the very theory which is on the test. They are only indirectly measurable by measuring other variables which are correlated with the variable whose value you want to find out. And the correlation is asserted by the theory, right? So this is the point here. These are scientific theories. In social sciences you call variables which are not directly measurable but which can only be indirectly inferred from other, from the values of other variables which you can measure. You call them latent variables. So in social science you often say latent variables instead of theoretical concepts. So first of all let me give you just some examples of different kinds of concepts. So you have here a, a certain degree. At the bottom you have the observation concepts which are observable in the strongest sense of the notion of observability, right? So, you know already from previous parts of my lecture that I admit, of course, we have to admit there is a certain degree between observability and non-observability. There is no clear, strict borderline here. It's not a black-white affair. But still, you can distinguish that, the two. So, the, those concepts which are in the strongest sense observable are like the like concepts in that line here. So here in this row, no, in this column, sorry, here in this column, I have example from physics or the physical sciences and this, in this com column I have example from the social sciences and from psychology. For instance, in physics, clearly observable concepts are stable, red, greater than. So it's just first intuitively, right? Um, this is the intuition. Something is greater than. So this is greater than this. All of us can affirm it. I mean, you know, this is clearly observable. You know, of course there are borderline cases where this is, is no longer so clear. So assume that this is just two millimeter greater than this. Then this no longer, in fact it is. See? Uh, it's no longer clearly observable that this is greater than this because the difference is too low. So something is only clearly observable it's, if it is clearly above the threshold of observable discriminability, right? The, my perception threshold, as I call it, for instance. But we assume that. Then, in physics, you usually call length and time as observable variables. I mean, of course, you need a, a metric tape, uh, right? To, to measure the length, like uh, of, of of that, uh, the length of the table, right? But measuring by metric tape is purely conventional. There is no theory involved. It's just a definition, an operation. It's not the proper theory as we understand it. So it's also an empirical concept. On the beneath, in midst of observation concepts and theoretical concepts, there is what we call an empirical disposition concept, right? So. For instance, solvability in water, that is an empirical disposition concept. What is the difference to an observation concept? It's the following. An observable property is observable under normal conditions of observation. I have nothing to do with it. Just look at these two things and see this is longer than this. Right? The, under normal condition of, of observation, of visual observation, light must be present. Um, I cannot find out whether a piece, say, 
there would be some, some, some piece some, which looks like sugar, but I don't know whether it is sugar or another mineral. Uh, I can, cannot find out by pure observation whether something is, dissolves, uh, is, is solvable in water, right? I have to perform an operation with it, a test operation. I have to, to put it into water and then I can observe whether it is solvable or not. So an empirical disposition concept, for in order to observe whether this concept applies or not, you need to perform a test operation. You need to manipulate the objects which you observed. This, this is the difference between an observation concept and an empirical disposition concept. To verify a disposition concept by observation, you need to manip manipulate the object which you observe. This, by the way, was uh, the maxim of the so-called operationalists, right? That we, the true scientific observation is by means of manipulating. And we have heard a lot of, a lot of uh, things and respects in which this uh, idea of the operationalist is, of course, true. We have heard about the importance and the value of experiments in science and all of these things. Anyhow, so, but an empirical disposition concept is still not what we mean by a theoretical concept. A theoretical concept, for instance, in physics, is a concept of, start, let's start with this concept, an atom. An atom is just much, much too small to be seen or in any sense observed. It's a hypothetical object, right? And the reason why chemists in the 18th century or so, and 19th century, came up with the atomic hypothesis, particularly then in the 19th century, in the beginning, um, was, was very subtle. I cannot speak about this history now, but of course, uh, for instance, the law of constant proportions among chemical reactions and all different evidences, a lot of evidences, had their best explanation by assuming that the matter, a matter of macro, of, of our ordinary bodies, um, this matter consists of tiny, tiny atoms, of many, many of them, which are much too small to be seen. So that, that is the hypothesis of, of the atoms. So atom is a theoretical concept. Um, electric field, of course, is a theoretical concept in physics. You cannot observe an electric field. I mean, nobody can observe it. I am a magnetic field. But that is not the, an a priori truth that magnetic field cannot be observed. It's an empirical truth about our sense organs, right? That is important. Someone who pointed that out the distinction between observability and theoreticity is not a semantic distinction. And some authors originally had it, but it's an empirical psychological distinction. That was Van Froasen, who pointed out that very early. For instance, some fish have magnetic sensors, but we don't have it. So for us, magnetic field is a theoretical uh, property. But likewise, mass in the sense of physics is not a disposition concept. And you will see that in the course of the lecture, that mass is not a disposition concept. And force, likewise, is not a disposition concept. There are some people in philosophy of science, and still today, still today, that there are some people um, who are saying that you should equate theoretical concepts with empirical disposition concepts, right? These are the, the general, the operationalists. This is a philosophical direction. But the dominant view, and also the view to which the logical empiricists then were inclined, the view which the logical empiricists adopted in the fifth, 1950s and 1960s, it's the view that theoretical concepts are significantly different from empirical disposition concepts, right? And one who clearly had this view was Carnap, but very late. He didn't have it earlier. He had it to a certain extent already in, sorry, in, 90, in his 90. 56 paper, the methodological character of theoretical concepts, but he clearly had it then in 1966 when he wrote his book, The Philosophy of the Natural Sciences. So what is the difference then between theoretical concepts and empirical disposition concepts? I will speak about uh, that question a, a lot in, two of, in the course of this lecture. Today I just mentioned some basic facts. The major difference is, as you will see, 
An empiricalist position is defined by just one law of correspondence, as I will, as I will explain it, 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 so to speak. The meaning of solvability in water is, 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 is just defined by that uh, definition, that if it put something in water, it will be dissolved. But a theoretical concept is not identical with one disposition, a theoretical concept is the cause of many empirical dispositions. So like, uh, for instance, the cause of solubility in water is the electric polarity of molecules, and the electric polarity or the type of dipolarity, that they are dipoles um, of molecules is not equivalent with this disposition, but it's the cause of a lot of other dispositions. So that will be my thesis, which I will explain to you. So my thesis will be that theoretical concepts are the causes of empirical disposition concepts, but they are not semantically reducible to them, right? Okay. So let's look at the psychological and social sciences here. We didn't speak about that column so far. For instance, in the, in the social sciences or psychological sciences, a typical theoretical concept is intelligence, right? And a typical empirical concept is the result of an intelligence test, a test score, right? Why is this so? Because, you know, intelligence, this is a, a theoretical, so to speak, a, a, a a ba uh, the hypothesis is that the basic hidden ability of a person which you call intelligence it is not identical with any particular intelligence test for instance there's a, the Weichsler intelligence test there are other intelligence tests and there's a controversy about how uh, w what is the right intelligence test it's also known that there are different kinds of intelligence. There's mathematical intelligence, physical intelligence, verbal intelligence, and so on. Maybe there's social intelligence too. And they are correlated but to different degrees, right? Uh, so intelligence is a cause of, of certain scores, of certain performances on different kinds of cognitive tests with measure. And each test, right? measures a certain empirical disposition, a disposition to, uh, to, to get a certain test score in a particular test. But intelligence itself is the cause of these abilities, right? not identically with any particular one of that. And that makes it a theoretical concept. And you know, there is also this debate in the psychology of intelligence whether there is really one the G factor, right? there's one intelligence, one uh, kind of intelligence, which a common cause. There might be more special abilities too, but whether the general intelligence is something like that in the human brain, right? Uh, or whether they are just two more or less independent, uh, or more than two independent cognitive abilities, which together make up what we call in common sense intelligence. And the hypothesis, there is something like a general intelligence factor, it's called the G hypothesis in the intelligence controversy. And it is it's confirmed to a certain degree. But all these controversies make it clear that intelligence is a typical example of a theoretical concept. To be, dis to be distinguished, right, from observation concepts, which are the concrete test scores, but also from empirical dispositions, which would be the disposition of a certain pers person to get a certain test score at a certain experiment, which of course may vary. The person may be more or less sleepy, so it, the actual test scores may have a certain dispersion, but the disposition to get on these tests, kind of test, a certain score, that would be an empirical disposition. Paul, you wanted to say something um, to that? I'm just wondering what something like intelligence is more like a folk concept that we try to provide some. We try to provide a, a theory and replace that that folk concept with a theoretical concept, but we haven't succeeded in doing that. And that's in distinction with these other physical, physicalistic theoretical concepts, which seem to be uh, very well defined and introduced for specific purposes to explain. Autism. Yeah, but you will you will see that there is no empirical definition of mass. I mean, mass is a theoretical concept. So we have a precise theory about mass, but I mean, it's, it's still, it's, it's not so clear. It's a kind of theoretical decision whether you will see what is the inertial mass. Uh, the, the one is the inertial mass, and, uh, and the, the other one is the gravitational mass. Whether these two masses are really one and the same concept, 
But you, have we come to that point? In this direction. Okay. Third is example. Uh, an interest in computers correlates with a disinterest in social relations. By the way, this, ex this uh, finding, this statistical finding, was made before. If you so we uh, don't have precise empirical criteria for, for mass, or but we do have a, a per, uh, precise theory. Yeah, but, but only under certain test conditions, and, and we have several criteria. So there is no one criteria in which acts as an analytic definition. Okay. That's one difference which I will point out, but. But independent from that point, I certainly agree to you that intelligence is originally a folk concept and the question is whether there exists a, third, a theory of intelligence in which a general uh, competence called intelligence plays an important causal role. And that is exactly the controversy. And by tests like factor analysis, you know, what you do in social sciences then, one method is factor analysis, so you have, assume you have You have different kind of tests. So, and, and you have different kind of test results. So each, the disposition of each person to get a, a certain result on each test, which, which has a certain dispersion, call that one empirical disposition. So, so these are the test results for n tests of, of a person. Right? You consider you make pair t tests. And then all of them are correlated right, to a certain extent. So these tests uh, deviate in some respect. Some focus more on mathematical skills, some on verbal skills, some more on general, ask general puzzles, uh, and so on. Some tests use more pictures, some tests use more words. And then the question is, is that dominant, uh, you do factor analysis, You're, so you want to explain the correlations between all these n, say, n, say 10, uh, different tests by a few causal factors, and that explanation is, is a one factor. This factor analysis gives you such information, uh, which 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 explains a lot of these correlations. Of course, there are variations, so you need some other factors here too. So, for instance, the verbal skills would not be completely determined by your general IQ. Or social skills would not be completely determined by your general IQ. Or just by perceptual skills, like how quickly you perceive something. You, you would have to include other, other theoretical factors here too. But if that theoretical factors, which is called general intelligence, explains a high amount of correlation, that would support the thesis that there is something like intelligence. And if, if that is not the case, if there is no, no factor which is, which is causally dominant, then the hypothesis would be more confirmed that intelligence is really a heterogeneous cluster of abilities. According to my knowledge, that is the state of the controversy in, in the psychology of intelligence today. Right? That's how they discuss it. Right. Yeah. I mean, there's also the distinction from, I think it's from Reichenbach, I mean, all yes. the thing between abstracta and elata. Yeah. Maybe, so, yeah. It seems like some of these uh, theoretical concepts seem to correspond to more to, like intelligence, maybe to an abstract, whereas uh, things like atoms are elata. So yeah. You actually but, think there's a but people in, in, in the brain science, in the neural science, really f want to find out where the chi factor, the channel intelligence is located. So at that level they really go from the abstract to the concrete. So there are hypotheses that the channel is somewhere located here, a certain region of the brain, there you have a general intelligence. And the hypothesis is that the general intelligence has a lot to do with general learning ability. So people who have a high, a high chi factor, they, they, often they develop slowly, they, learn, they are able to learn anything, everything, right? Even if, if they have low perceptual skills, they become very good readers after some time. So the, the learning ability, for instance, is something which is high in people with a high chi factor, uh, and things like that. And that is located, located in a certain region of the brain. That is what the defenders of the chi factor hypothesis uh, as, uh, tell us, right? Yeah. Okay, that would make it more similar. Yeah. So, um, okay, so you see similar third and character social structure would be theoretical concepts in the social sciences, 
result of an interview uh, like would be empirical concept for instance the religious tendency of a person is a typical example of a theoretical concept because it's not really identical with how often I go to church my religious tendency, how, how, what is my tendency to believe there is something transcendental, there is some, something uh, going beyond my experience, uh, there is some uh, intelligent cause of, of the universe, right? or, uh, things like that. It's measured in, by interviews, for instance. A lot of sociologists have designed a lot of interviews uh, consisting of many questions, and these are then the observable variables of their tests, but religion, the religiosity of the people, that is the theoretical variable in the case. Okay, next time I will speak about some problems in, in the more precise discrimination between observation concepts and theoretical concepts. I will explain to you my account to observation concepts, namely in my account I characterize observation concepts as those concepts who are ostensibly learnable and that will be the topic of the next lecture. So far for today. Thank you.